Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, in this exciting uh, workshop on uh, human behavior modeling. As uh, you may know, this is the third workshop of a series of workshops that we have been organizing uh, within the scope of the European uh, Project Rayuela. Uh, the first one was focused on a serious game. The second one was uh, focused on the relationship between um, um, cybercrime and technology. And this one is focused on, um, on uh, human behavior modeling. Um, I would like to uh, especially thank uh, our speakers today. Uh, Nereida Bueno, uh, who is uh, the World Package uh, leader of the World Package related to this topic in the uh, Rayuela project. Uh, uh, Professor Mary Aiken, uh, who is uh, participating in the CC Driver project and is also uh, leading a workshop, a work package related to this topic. Uh, uh, Professor Ancio Sanchez, uh, who was uh, the coordinator of the European project uh, Ibsen, and uh, well, uh, Nereida Bueno and uh, Edmond. Uh, Nereida Bueno is assistant uh, associate professor in here in Comillas. And finally, Ed Edmond Awad is uh, assistant professor in the University of Exeter, and he was the leader of the a famous experiment, uh, the MIT model machine. So uh, this is the, the agenda for today. Um, I will uh, start uh, with a very brief presentation of the project. And after uh, that, we will have a, a 15 minutes presentation from the speakers. And uh, finally, uh, we will have uh, like 30 minutes for uh, question and answers and uh, discussion. Uh, that we hope that uh, you take advantage of it to uh, ask any question that uh, uh, may uh, appear during the, the workshop. So uh, regarding the Rayuela project, this is an European Union funded project. Uh, uh, it's a three years project and it started in October, 2020. Um, the consortium is composed of 17 partners from nine different European countries. Uh, that covers uh, the most uh, relevant geographical areas in Europe. But uh, we are especially, um, uh, I think that it's especially relevant to highlight that the uh, consortium is um, um, multidisciplinary. Uh, we come with the law enforcement agencies, with uh, psychologists, sociologists, uh, lawyers, uh, ethics, uh, philosophers, experts in ethics, uh, educators, and also with the uh, engineers and computer science, since we think that um, there is no other way to uh, address uh, a problem like the, the one that uh, we, we will address in, in the project. Uh, what uh, do we want to, to achieve in the Rayuela project? Well, um, we want to develop um, a serious game, an interactive uh, serious game, uh, with two purposes. Uh, on the one side, uh, we would like to uh, educate young people uh, in uh, good practices uh, online. And on the other side, uh, we will also like to gather uh, data in a friendly and non-invasive manner to try to identify potential risk profiles uh, to uh, provide uh, law enforcement agencies with the uh, evidences uh, to develop a public policy. And how do we plan to achieve this goal? Well, here you have an overview of uh, um, the, um, how, uh, how the work is organized in the project. Uh, in the first stage, uh, which is uh, uh, taking place right now during the first year of the project, we will uh, carry out a thorough research on uh, the human factors affecting the cyber uh, crimes that we consider, which are mainly uh, cyberbullying, online grooming, and human trafficking with uh, uh, sexual exploitation purposes. Uh, and also, uh, we will uh, carry out a, a thorough research on the technological uh, threats associated to connected devices um, uh, used by, uh, by minors. After this uh, first stage, uh, we will uh, translate the main findings of, of this first stage into a, 
uh, into the video game. Uh, so uh, the video game will have, uh, in principle, different cyber adventures that will address these topics in a subtle uh, manner. And in these cyber adventures, the, the players uh, may uh, make decisions. Uh, uh, and depending on the decisions, they may end up in a, a risky or safe situation. So uh, this is indeed um, uh, like in the famous novel from uh, Julio Cortázar, also known, also named Rayuela, uh, that the story depends on the decision that the, the reader makes. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, the, the miners will uh, definitely um, learn uh, good practices on uh, the internet. Um, we usually say that this is something similar to uh, how uh, pilots uh, learn how to uh, pilot a plane uh, in a flight simulator. They learn uh, uh, stuff that is useful for the real world, but they do it in a uh, a scenario uh, which is um, uh, risky, we, we has no no risk. Okay, but uh, apart from this, uh, we also want to gather um, uh, the data uh, obtained through the game and uh, analyze it and interpret it uh, together with our law uh, colleagues from uh, psychology and uh, sociology and with the law enforcement agencies. Uh, to uh, identify uh, risky profiles, uh, as I mentioned before. So uh, this is indeed uh, uh, what it is related uh, with this uh, specific workshop. Uh, now we will see um, different uh, uh, approaches to human behavior modeling, and uh, we will start with uh, Nereida Bueno. So. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, Nere, you can share yours uh, whenever you want. Okay, now you might be seeing it. Give me a sec, please. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, is it working? Perfect. I think it is. Can you yeah, see yeah. my screen? Okay. Perfect, Nere. Let me uh, briefly introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, Eda Bueno is associate professor in uh, Comillas University, and he's also the World Package Leader related with the, uh, the human factors affecting the cyber crimes mentioned before in the project Rayuela. She's a psychologist and criminologist, and she has worked in the crossroads of economic behavior cross-cultural psychology and criminal profiling. Therefore, modeling behavior for her is understanding how humans choose uh, to perform actions at some cost within the framework of a given culture and influenced by some individual characteristics. So uh, whenever you want, Nere, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Diego. And thanks everyone for attending this um, brief talk, which is entitled Criminology and human behavioral modeling. And I would like to start with a question. You do not need to answer it aloud. Just uh, keep the answer uh, to yourself. Let's see where I can pass the slide here. And so my first question to you is, how will you picture a thief while stealing something? Take just a few seconds to try to figure out how will you picture that thief. Um, that's the image that you have um, produce um, some coincidence with this. Usually when we think of a thief, we will think of uh, someone at night, not in the middle of the day, maybe wearing some black clothes, using a mask not to be identified, also having this bag to, to try to get all the money in cash, and also on tiptoes, right? Um, even if, if it's not a very handsome guy, it, it will probably fit more the kind of an image that we have. Um, is this a type of thieves that we usually find in uh, penitentiary centers in jail? Probably not. This is not the kind of, of guys that we, that we face in there, but this is the kind of image that we have about thieves. Even more, if I ask you, what do you think that this thief is going to do next after stealing some money? Whether he's going to stop by and um, place some chess 
or whether he's going to try to escape in, in a car, probably you will choose the option B. So does this mean that we all are fortune tellers and we can figure out all the behaviors that humans do and even criminal behaviors and we all are criminologists? Of course, it is not. We are just applying heuristics and behavioral modeling. Heuristics, I am the first uh, one presenting, so maybe all the guys after me are going also to define what is modeling for them or what are heuristics for them. So let me just be the one uh, giving a definition. Heuristics are some paths that um, allow to save some time when predicting things. So imagine, for example, I always put this example that you have forgotten something at home, uh, for example, your keys. And you go inside home, or well, you cannot go inside home because you have forgotten your keys. So imagine that you have forgotten the keys of your car and you go inside home trying to figure out where they are. You will probably go to the places where you usually put those keys. So you, in order to find the keys, you will need to check all the house entirely. And you're not going to do that because probably the keys are not going to be inside the fridge. Uh, so you're using heuristics. You're going to the probable to the likely places where you will have put them. So this is what we do in criminal um, human behavioral modeling. We try to figure out which are the most common things that people do in a certain circumstances. So if we define modeling and we take the Harvard definition, we will, uh, uh, sorry, we will see that they say our approach to modeling human behavior is to consider the human as a device with a large number of internal mental states, each with its own particular control behavior and interstate transition probability. So this means that we all can be predicted. Um, uh, to predict someone, we need to do um, a lot of predictions in different uh, mediator factors or mental states until you rise to, to, the, to the behavior itself. But is this... Um, this is something that we can really do. Can we predict uh, people's behavior? Uh, if we do this in criminal modeling, uh, it means that we are assuming three facts. First one, it is that we can predict human behavior, that we can synthesize human behavior in equations. And these equations will have um, specific values, factors, things that are affecting behavior with a specific ways because not um, all the factors are going to affect the same, right? So for example, if you have been victimized, uh, maybe that victimization is going to have some influence in your future behavior, but maybe not that much as if you had, for example, uh, as if you have some mental disorder. Uh, maybe the mental disorder has some weight different from having been victimized. Our assumption too is that any given criminal behavior uh, will entail certain common personal and environmental circumstances. Obviously, we need to assume this because if we are not assuming that criminal behavior has some commonalities, uh, we are not going to be able to model that uh, criminal behavior. And finally, in order to be able to model criminal behavior, we will need to study multiple variables, not only one, two or three, but multiple variables in multiple offenders in order to try to take the individuality or idiopathic um, uh, circumstances that can arise, right? Um, so by doing this, we are facing some limitations that I'm going to present at, at the end of this, of this talk. Um, okay, uh, but if we're um, just talking about some kind of, of criminal modeling that have been done so far, uh, potentially one of the first ones that will um, be in our minds, it is the geographical profiling by Kim Rosma. Uh, what Kim Rosma did was um, uh, trying to put in a map all the places where offenders uh, had or did some activity. Uh, by activity, uh, he meant or meant um, not only the assaults or the thieves or the whatever criminal activity he did, but also the place uh, where he could, um, for example, hide some of the material and also the places that their home places. So by trying to put all of these uh, places within a map and trying to figure out the connections between these places, he will eventually have 
these hot and cold places where the police will probably find this guy hiding. And this, of course, had um, a lot of uh, consequences in the sense that you can trace uh, the guys and you can find the guys. So this modeling is not taking into consideration personality uh, nor um, personal things, but only geographical uh, in, in a coordinated map, so with an X and a Y axis. And this way you could trace the guys. But can we also model um, personality factors? Well, we have been doing this with risk assessment tools. Uh, there on the left, you have some of the tools that have been and are being used a lot uh, worldwide. Uh, these tools have been produced across three generations. In the first generation, um, the risk assessment that, that the professional will do will be based or will be grounded only in a clinical assessment, in a clinical eye, let's see. So he, the professional, will do some non-structured judgment, and maybe because of his or her experience, um, because of all the guys that he or she had um, assessed previously, he will produce some report saying how risky is this guy or how likely is this guy to uh, commit the offense again. So all the model will be done just based on a clinical eye. And of course, as you may think, uh, this kind of assessment produced a lot of uh, mistakes, um, up to 50% of, of probability, uh, even more, 70% of probability. So we need to produce different risk assessment tools. And then it comes the second generation. In the second generation, the tools were based only in aesthetic factors. By aesthetic, it means immutable factors. So things that the guy uh, who is being assessed cannot change things in the past, uh, such as, for example, uh, which kind of um, relation or bones he had with his uh, family, or uh, which kind of things happened during his childhood, adulthood, um, um, and during the adolescence. Um, this will entail trying to dig into the past of the guys being assessed and trying to also find the specific weight of each uh, factor. But also, it came with a problem which is that um, it is somehow deterministic, right? So if these things happen in the past, then this is going to, uh, to, to happen in the, in the future. Um, we psychologists think that people can change <laughs> because of that we study psychology, right? So because of that, it came the third generation of these kind of tools. The risk assessment tools of, from the third generation combine static and dynamic factors. Dynamic factors are those that are not immutable. So these things that people can change, for example, personality or um, clinical factors or drug um, consumption, because you can change the drug consumption. You can change the way that people face with things uh, day by day. And with this third generation tool, which is the tool that we are using currently at prisons, we can combine the factors uh, that in the past have surely an influence in the present, but also those factors that can be changed and modified. And because of that, we can say that we can try to make people not to uh, commit again crimes. So we are trying now to predict the future uh, with things that we cannot change, but with things that we can actually change. Um, for example, one of the instruments that is being used the most is this the HCR20, 20 because of the number of items that it has. And HCR stands for History, Clinical, and Risk Management. So as an example of historical factors, so those, those stative factors, those immutable factors, you will have H1, which is previous violence, or H7, which is being a psychopath. Being a psychopath could be also considered clinical, but as it is um, said, uh, because of the amount of studies that we have now, that has uh, some kind of uh, not only genetical factors, but also something which is settled down from a very early age, then that's why it is in the historical um, item. In the clinical items, you will find, for example, um, absence of insight or negative attitudes, things that we can change. And in risk management, things as, for example, not having some future planning or not having uh, social support. So things that 
uh, maybe are not that inside the guy, but it's affecting the, the future also and the risk of committing a new offense. Here in Spain, we also have the Biogen, the Biogen, which uh, will stand for uh, domestic violence. It is a huge database that the um, uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs have access to with all the uh, cases of this kind of violence in each region that we have. You know that Spain is divided into 17 regions. Um, within each region, all the guys will be monitored side, which means that we are uh, periodically assessing them some um, uh, factors, also dynamic um, and aesthetic factors in order to produce this kind of table in which you see the level of risk which is from not appreciated, uh, absolutely no risk, to low risk, medium risk, uh, high risk, and extreme risk. And you have here the number of cases that we have in each level. Um, this table is produced every, I think, um, uh, three months in order to know um, how many cases we have and if uh, these uh, guys in medium, um, high, and extreme level will need some special treatment or approach or, um, or, or more um, uh, control, right? So these uh, risk assessment tools based on modeling human behavior are currently being used by our law and enforcement agencies in order to try to avoid um, a more criminal raid. Do these um, tools have some limitations, come with limitations? Yeah, of course. For example, one, it is the data availability. So if you belong to the law and enforcement agencies, you will have access, plenty of access to the data that may interest to you for doing uh, modeling behavior, uh, human uh, behavior modeling. But we as researchers, if we do not have, if we do not belong to these law and enforcement agencies, will struggle with, with having access to this data. And then we are not going to be able to um, um, cooperate or in, in the sense that we, we want to cooperate that we cannot because we do not have access to the data that we need in order to do our equations. Also, uh, imagine that the data will be available. There are a lot of crimes that are not reported um, by, by the population, by victims or they are not reported or they are underreported. And this comes with a problem, which is that maybe the crimes that are being reported are the, um, the worst cases that you can imagine so that we will be accessing to a lot of information, but for from a part of the crimes that are not the most common cases that you will face day by day um, in the criminal history of some country, also minor crime far exceeds major crime, uh, which usually entails that, right? That we are focusing a lot on major crimes and we are able to produce very beautiful models, but these are not the crimes that are the most abundant ones. So why not trying to focus on these minor crimes, which are day by day uh, filling our um, uh, commissaries, right? Our police stations. Um, also, we need to uh, tackle with four fallacies. These are uh, extracted from this very uh, beautiful paper by Folson in 2010, which are the dramatic fallacy, the one that I was uh, recently saying. So taking those crimes to model, those crimes from TV, those dramatic cases and forgetting about the ordinary crimes. Also the not me fallacy, which means that we may think that the guys that we are modeling their behavior are not like me. And they have different, very different circumstances. Uh, whereas they are also sharing with us, with you, uh, the culture, even the, the, the place where they are living. So many factors that are affecting to us are also affecting to the guys that we are analyzing. And sometimes we forget about that and we treat them as if they were very different, very, um, yeah, very different from us. The ingenuity fallacy, which means that we may think that they are very skilled guys in order to uh, perform some crimes, but sometimes and many times, and many crimes are uh, committed without very being very skilled because the crimes are simple. They are minor crimes such as stealing something at some supermarket or even maybe the drug dealing, which 
of is not easy to do, I mean, but which can be easier than, for example, sexual offending or, or other uh, crimes which are uh, taking us, us harder, right? And the final fallacy that we can find it is that the cops and courts fallacy, which is only um, focusing on the informed cases and not in the reported cases. Uh, so with um, this, I will be finishing the, um, the last question that I would like to raise, it is whether cyber criminology and criminology modeling should differ. And I think that my answer is yes. Let's see what Mary says after me. And I will say yes, because there are different relevant factors that need to be introduced in these equations with these uh, waived values, such as the dissimilation that we all know that arise when uh, we are uh, surfing on the internet. Also that the internet is, has plenty of access, 24 hours access, whereas others um, crimes do not have access. So for example, if you want to steal at some place, that place needs to be accessible to you. Also, when you are uh, doing cyber crimes, you can be more anonymous than when you are doing analog crimes. Also, there are no geographical barriers. So the kind of geographical modeling that I was um, previously showing, the one by Kim Rosmo, will be very difficult to be performed when you are analyzing cyber crimes. And also, you can potentially access to a wider array of victims because for a new computer, you can have access, more access to, to victims than if you were face by face, right? So probably new modeling is needed. And I hope that Mary can shed some light of, about this. How is Rajuela trying to model cyber crimes? Uh, very briefly, we're using three sources, which is literature, sentences, and interviews. In order to try to configure which are the factors that we need to put into these um, equations and waiving these values, we are digging into the specific literature about those crimes, trying to uh, see which are the factors that we need to take into account. We are doing the same with the sentences, trying thus to focus on real crimes, not only in the literature on the major crimes, but also in those crimes that day by day are being reported. And finally, uh, going and approaching victims and offenders and interviewing them and also interviewing experts so that they can uh, tell us which are the factors that we need to take into account. And with all these three sources of information, we are trying to figure out the equations that will better explain the cyber crimes. Thanks a lot. You have here my mail and I'm open to questions now or after the, the talk. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nereida, for the very interesting presentation. Just uh, one last comment regarding the last slide on uh, methodology. We also plan to uh, um, use the, the video game uh, as a kind of uh, amplifier to, to this methodology. We think this is something uh, innovative in, in this uh, context. And we will have uh, also uh, presentations uh, on this afterwards. As you know, we have uh, at the end of the of the workshop a uh, specific uh, slot for a uh, question and answer. So uh, let's wait uh, for questions to, to this slot. And now we'll move on to a uh, couple of presentations uh, where uh, human behavior uh, will be, is, is a model used in games, which is something related with the Rajuela project indeed. We will start with a presentation uh, delivered from uh, Professor Angel Sanchez. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Sanchez received his PhD in theoretical physics from Universidad Complutense de Madrid in 1991. And he was a Fulbright postdoctoral researcher at Los Alamos National Lab between 1993 and 1994. Currently, he's full professor of applied mathematics at Universidad Carlos III de Madrid where he founded the interdisciplinary group in complex systems in 1996. He has contributed to the advancement sorry, of different fields and uh, now his uh, current research deals with mostly uh, human behavior on complex social and socio-technical systems. As part of his research activities, he has been the prime investigator of more than 20 projects and in particular, he was the coordinator of the FET project, uh, Bridging the Gap, from individual behavior to the socio-technical man, the Eastern project, uh, which is the one uh, he will uh, tell us about uh, right now. So uh, thank you very much for joining today, uh, uh, Ancho, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the for the introduction. And uh, indeed, what I'm going to tell you about is this project we run. This is the title of the talk, but because I'm going to focus on the differential things we've done with this project. But the official title was, as uh, has been said already, this one here. We wanted to uh, go from uh, individual behavior to a more uh, collective way of looking into human behavior. And indeed, uh, as uh, your kind introduction just said, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I'm interested in collective phenomena more than individual phenomena. However, individual behavior is key for me to understand the collective phenomena in the real world. And in fact, my, uh, my project started from the ideas in the early 2010s that uh, we should be able to simulate the whole world. But for that, you need to understand how people interact with each other. And that's the information we were trying to, to look into. So that's not just our idea, but even, for instance, DARPA, the, the research agency of the Defense Department of the United States, was looking for this type of, of thing, a, a world simulator in a way. But to that, you need to understand, like I said, human behavior, decision making, how we interact with each other, and that means not only how we behave with each other, but also how are we connected. And that's another part of my research, our uh, networks of relationships, which I'd not be, I, I won't be talking about today, but that's also another part of the problem. So for today, we are focusing mostly on uh, interactions that are perhaps virtual or digital, happening at a large scale, and I'll come to back to that in a second, and among people that are probably culturally, geographically, or whatever uh, distant, okay? So within our, goal, our project, the goal was to develop a capacity for investigating things that happen in large structured groups with controlled experiments. Uh, you can read more about our uh, ideas in this uh, paper here, but let me go directly to my main point today, and that is what is large? What does it mean large? So you could think of large as just many people, okay? Uh, and for that, if you want to do that, you just can have an experiment that is carried out with a number of subjects that is large. You take 500 subjects, 1,000 subjects, whatever. That's typically allows to go beyond the usual pools to study how things depend on demographics and backgrounds. So the improvement in your statistics is large as the number of subjects grows, okay? Uh, for that, you need just if you're going to do economically oriented experiments like we were focusing on, in which you have to uh, pay the uh, subjects according to what the decisions were in the experiment, if you want to do this, you don't need Ibsen. You just need a lot of people and then a lot of money to pay these people. That's it. What we wanted to do is experiments in which there were 500, 1,000 people participating in the experiment simultaneously. And that means that they, uh, the, the focus is on the collective behavior, not only on what people do, but what's the result of the interaction of all those people that are uh, acting on the same situation, on the same context, okay? And that's why we wanted to do this, and that's why we got a FED open project to do this, because it's really complicated, okay? So I don't want to... Uh, really uh, get you bored by giving you details of what we did and what not. We have developed a, uh, our own uh, software for doing experiments. We have our server, we have our database of volunteers. Uh, and if anybody's interested in all these details, there's a lot on our website, but also I can uh, tell that uh, separately. What I want to do today is just to give you two examples of what we have done within Ibsen. So you can appreciate what we can do differently from other people. And perhaps uh, the uh, Rayuela team may want to do something along these lines at some point or, or whatever. So the first experiment is a very simple one. It's about information effects on a very well-known model. And that is the public goods game, okay? In the public goods game, this is a situation to study uh, cooperation in the presence of people that do not cooperate. Okay, so you have a bunch of people that cooperate, meaning contribute to some public good, and then there's a bunch of people that don't, okay? 
So economists model this by these public good games, in which you give people some money, and then you tell them, okay, if you contribute part of all or all of your money to a common pot, then we will take this common pot, multiply it by some number, and distribute it among everybody. And that's the key. It's not distributed only among those who cooperated, but among everybody, including free riders, people that didn't contribute. So everybody gets benefits irrespective of what they contributed or not. Okay, this is a classics game. It has been uh, studied in experiments very many times. And what I'm showing here is just an example, but you can take my word that there might be hundreds of papers on this, but this is the general thing that happens. So in this case, uh, people were given 20 money units or 20 euros if you want, and told that uh, this, this thing I told you, you put this in the common pot, gets multiplied, and then gets distributed among everybody. And as you can see, the behavior is always the same in this case. People typically contribute around half of their uh, initial endowment in the first round. The game is repeated a number of times. And then as the game is repeated, people realize, okay, there's people doing nothing, so I will stop contributing myself. And this is basically what's you can observe here and that's like i said very generic okay and that's i guess it's also <coughs> excuse me familiar to all of you in your daily life this is a very common situation now the thing is that this has been done on groups where only like six or ten people were interacting and we wanted to see what happens uh, in a larger group mostly because people won't be able to handle the information <laughs> Excuse me. So people here were given uh, the information of what everybody else contributed. But in a, in a setup, <coughs> sorry, in a setup in which you have a thousand of partners, you won't be able to see what everybody is doing. So you have to give them information on the average, on the standard deviation, on, on whatever. So. Uh, this is just another example uh, showing the same behavior in all these different towns. So this is a very universal thing. Now, this is what we did. This is already our results. These are groups of 100 people. And then there is this, uh, this one here I'm following, which has 1,000 people doing this uh, at the same time. And that's something that, to the best of my knowledge, has never been done and only our platform can handle. Uh, 100 people. I know a couple of examples, but just very ad hoc. This we can do routinely. We're working with a thousand people. It's a little bit more complicated, but can be done. So what you see here is first that it takes longer for the contributions to decline. And in fact, sometimes they, uh, they go up at the beginning, like in this particular case. But the trick here, and the thing I want to really focus on is the information we gave the people. And that changes a lot because even if the behaviors look similar, and I'm plotting the average contribution, they are not similar at all. And this, I hope that this uh, slide will show you the difference. So this is uh, one of the groups we studied. And here, the information we gave was the average of everybody's contribution in the previous one. If you do this, the heat map tells you that most and uh, most people get to contribute around the uh, average of the previous rounds okay and you can see it here this is the average and this is the distribution now when we not only gave them the average but told them uh simplified histogram because we were worried that people would not understand an histogram but we told them okay 20 people 20 percent of people contributed between zero and two uh, 15 between two and four and so on and so forth it looks like the behavior doesn't change much. It, the average is a little bit higher, but that's not really important. What's important is that in this case, the behavior gets polarized into lots of people that contribute everything they can and lots of people that contribute nothing. So the fact that we're giving them the histogram and giving them more details on how everybody is behaving is really changing a lot the individual behavior. Here, most people play by contributing like around half of what they have. And here, even if the average look the same, more, half of the people more or less contribute everything and half contribute nothing. 
And that is really a huge difference in terms of individual behavior. And that's a factor that arises because you have many people interacting and the information is necessarily limited, okay? So that would be my first example. Now, my second example is a very recent uh, paper, which we hope it will come out soon in uh, Nature Communications, in which we studied the effect of social norms on uh, climate change or in general on, 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 on disasters, let's say. And for that, we focused on social norms. And that is uh, something that uh, has been pointed to as really the, the way collective things happen in the, in the uh, society. So uh, um, social norms are everywhere. And in this case, we really wanted to uh, understand whether they had a role in climate change and whether climate change affected the social norms and so on and so forth. But there were very little uh, empirical evidence about this. So we had to design an experiment. And for that, if you want to have an experiment, I'm still a physicist, I can only do experiments on things I can measure. And so we chose to focus on a generally accepted with different flavors definition of social norm in which a social norm consists of uh, something that it's first something you believe that uh, you uh, that other people will do in this situation. And then that would be the, the, your empirical expectations, let's say what other people would do. And then you also uh, have to uh, think of a part of normative expectations. What do you think other people want you to do? And that is the, the normative part. And that is something that is collective in the sense that it's not a social norm if it's just something I think, but it, these two expectations have to be shared among a sufficiently large group, which can be mediated by social networks or by your relationships or whatever. So by asking about expectations, we can infer social norms. And in fact, this type of approach has been proved very uh, successful. For instance, there's very nice work by Christina Vicchieri in using this uh, definition she proposed to fight uh, uh, female genital mutilation in, in in Africa with the UN, but that's just an example, okay? So let me now go to, uh, this is basically what I just said. You have to look into, ask the people, what do you believe others will do? And then what do you believe others believe you should do, okay? So we have an experiment, and this is, again, something you cannot do in a typical uh, economics uh, experimental lab. It lasted for 30 days. So people could access from wherever they were uh, by just accessing our web and uh, introducing their daily decision. Every day they had to make a decision at any time they wanted. And uh, then their decision every day was a game that is a little bit similar to the previous one. You have to contribute to a common pot. But here the trick is that if the sum of the contributions doesn't reach a certain threshold, then everybody, contributed or not, loses everything they have with some probability, which we will use two values, low and high probability, okay? So the thing is, if everybody contributes, well, not everybody, if the sum of the contributions reaches this threshold, then you keep what you didn't contribute. If the sum of the contributions shies uh, away from this threshold, then everybody loses everything with some probability. And this decision was taken every day in groups that change it every day. So we people would eventually meet almost everybody else. And every day we also ask them about their expectations. Okay. This is how our interface looked like. This is the decision, how much you would contribute. Then this is the question about how much we should contribute. This is your personal normative beliefs. What is what's in your mind about that? And then we ask them what, uh, how much all the others in my group will contribute, okay? Now, the thing is that we also wanted this to be just uh, accurate, so not random answers there. So we told them that they would be paid with more points if their decisions matched or were similar to the decisions actually made by the players, which we have. So we can compare and, and reward these expectations accordingly. And then we also ask them about what others think you should do. And again, we can compare this to the personal normative beliefs that have been uh, elicited earlier and pay accordingly to the accuracy of the expectation. So it's not a survey. It's really something in which it's in your economic interest to be accurate, okay? Now, 
what we found with that, uh, well, here is what uh, happens basically uh, in summary in terms of uh, contributions, in terms of personal normative beliefs, empirical expectations and normative expectations. And we have two treatments, one in which the first two weeks were high risk of losing everything when you don't read the, the threshold, and the other two weeks were low and vice versa. And uh, of course, in the low high, you see an immediate amount of contributions. In the high low, you see how contributions decline, but then they decline faster. And the expectations change accordingly. But what's really important here, please forget about these equations, is that we can measure the norm strength by looking at the expectations of the people. And this is the norm strength, the norm of how much people should contribute. And this is uh, uh, what we observe. When you have a situation which you go from low to high uh, risk, then the social norm gets stronger quite quickly and people end up contributing more. When you go from high to low, it, it increases more than in the low case, but then it has some inertia. It doesn't go low as fast as it goes in the other case. Okay, so people contribute, uh, keep contributing more for longer times when you go from high to low. Okay, now we will also ask questions about what would you do if others did this, other than that, and the skipping all the details, basically it allowed, us, it allowed us to classify all the participants in different groups. And here, all these green guys are the ones that are really following social norms, where these are people following uh, the, the normative expectations, what do you think others believe you should do? And these are people who are copying behavior from others. So we can really assess the degree of diversity in, in rule following here. So I think I'm just in my time to finish. Uh, in this case, we saw that high catastrophe risk induces strong social norms. So in the case of climate change or the climatic emergency, we really need to communicate properly the risk in which we are. When risk decreases, standards lose strength. So you cannot uh, just uh, say uh, uh, it's very high the risk, but then allow people to, uh, to lose track of that. And this is also similar to what's going on with the COVID pandemic to some extent. And uh, in some cases, social norms have more influence on what people do than their own personal norms. But the population is very heterogeneous, and you have to take care of, of that. So just to close, uh, there's a lot of other applications with them, and skipping this. Just two very short comments. One is that large may actually be small. When we had an experiment on trading with 50 people in this complicated network, it was already very difficult to follow. They didn't get it. So large maybe a thousand people in some context but only 50 in other and then another thing we did is study uh, the application of our games to uh, the case of uh, uh, mental health and we designed a set of games with the community and we got some insights as to whether there could be indicators of mental health problems with this which I think it can also be relevant here and now yes I'm finished thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, Ancho, for the very interesting presentation. Um, I think that the, the questions uh, you uh, set in the, your last experiments, we are asking ourselves these kind of questions uh, on our day to day. And uh, the, the point with the uh, what is large and what is not is also uh, relevant for the Rayuela project. And uh, uh, the co-design of the games with the community is something that is also uh, very interesting for us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, now uh, we will move to uh, another, uh, I would say, blockbuster experiment uh, uh, using a, a kind of game and uh, uh, focusing on uh, moral psychology. Uh, the next uh, talk is going to be del delivered by uh, Dr. Edmond Awad, uh, who is a lecturer, assistant professor in the Department of Economics and the Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Exeter. He's also an associate research scientist at the Mass Plan Institute for Human Development, and is a founding editorial board member of the AI and Ethics Journal. Before joining the University of Exeter, Edmond was a postdoctoral associate at MIT Media Lab. And in 2016, uh, he led the design and development of uh, the experiment I have just mentioned, the Moral Machine. He will give us more detail on this uh, right now. And uh, 
uh, his uh, research work appear in major academic journals, including Nature, Venus, and Nature Human Behavior, and has been covered in major media outlets such as uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Le Monde, or El Pais. So, uh, Edmond, uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the nice intro. Thank you for inviting me for this interesting workshop. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Mora machine uh, experiment, uh, which is something that I've uh, worked on and still working on uh, on follow up work as well, um, uh, which started like a few years back. Uh, as you all know, uh, driverless cars are already being tested on the road and many experts think that they're going to become reality sometime soon. Uh, and some other experts make calculations and say that uh, these, uh, once they are on the road and once they are uh, done properly, uh, these cars will re uh, end up uh, with the result in reduction in 90% of the current uh, traffic uh, cra accidents or crashes that are happening by humans. Now, even if we uh, gonna accept this number as, uh, as correct, uh, there are still remaining 10%. Uh, and for those remaining 10%, um, uh, they may involve cases where the car have to resolve moral trade-offs. Uh, one a very maybe a stylized uh, version uh, to, to understand these moral trade-offs is inspired by something called the trolley problem, uh, which is um, a philosophical conundrum, uh, which was uh, proposed in philosophy, but was also studied in, uh, in psychology, anthropology, and uh, neuroscience, uh, and, uh, and more recently in computer science. Uh, this is now the, uh, uh, the computer science, or let's say the uh, the uh, uh, the automated vehicles uh, version of the trolley problem. Uh, so now you have a driverless car headed on the road, uh, and then uh, suddenly 10 pedestrians uh, jump in front of it, uh, brake fails, the car is about to kill those 10 pedestrians. The only way out is if it uh, swerves into a passerby, uh, which means the car will sacrifice this one person. Should the car do that, or should it just continue on its route to kill 10 pedestrians? In, in another version, the car would swerve into a barrier, and uh, sacrifice its own passenger? Should the car sacrifice uh, its own one passenger in order to save the 10 pedestrians? Um, uh, now, uh, these kind of decisions, uh, uh, obviously, in also in, in normal uh, in normative uh, uh, ethics, uh, they have some people have talked about uh, different acceptable answers. Uh, one of them is uh, understand, uh, understood as uh, utilitarianism, uh, which would, uh, in these situations, would say that uh, the car should do the decision that will result in the happiest of the most people. Um, which means uh, sacrificing the passenger. Uh, when people were asked in a study that was published in 2016 by my previous advisor and his collaborator, uh, they found that most people actually approve of these decisions, uh, but there was a catch. Uh, when they asked people if they think the car should uh, uh, sacrifice their own passengers in order to save 10 pedestrians, they said yes, but they, uh, they asked them if they're willing to buy these cars, uh, most of them said uh, no. Uh, which kind of resulted in some sort of a social dilemma uh, where everyone uh, think that everyone else uh, should do, uh, you know, should buy those cars, but no one would buy them themselves. Now, obviously, uh, maybe some of you are thinking about how likely, how likely are these uh, decisions or how, how these scenarios that I just mentioned, uh, and probably they are not very likely. Uh, maybe we don't really face the trolley uh, dilemma uh, in, in our driving, right? Uh, or maybe nobody faced that uh, trolley dilemma in, uh, in their driving. But the truth is uh, we do face uh, moral trade-offs uh, and we resolve moral trade-offs um, uh, around the day. For example, uh, suppose now you're going to buy a car and when you go to buy a car, you might decide whether you wanna buy this as an SUV, uh, which means it will give you, it's a big car, it will give you more protection to you and your family, but maybe at the cost of everyone else who have, you know, it's gonna be more risk on the uh, pedestrians. Uh, maybe it will be uh, less friend, uh, less environmental friendly, for example. So these are decisions that have some uh, ethical um, consequences uh, down the line. Uh, now, even after you buy the car, suppose you're driving in the road, uh, the decisions that you make are also have some uh, kind of uh, ethical considerations. And these are, uh, maybe we think of these ethical considerations more in terms of risk. Uh, so for example, suppose you are driving the car in the middle of the lane here, uh, the, 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 the white car, and you have this big truck on your right, this cyclist on your left. Uh, while you're still within your own lane, uh, maybe you, you could you might decide that you know you want to go a little bit further from this big truck, uh, uh, which means you are shifting more risk to this cyclist on your left, uh, or maybe you want to drive closer to the to the truck because you want to you know give more safety to the cyclist, which means more risk to yourself. 
Now, these are decisions that you make uh, uh, yourself while driving. Maybe you're not really paying attention about uh, the kind of risk that you're doing. Uh, maybe you have a different uh, ethical theories about who you should save. Maybe you're an altruist, uh, but when it comes to driving, you would save yourself because it's in the spur of the moment. But now think of uh, driverless cars, uh, which is something that is going to be uh, implemented. Uh, the code uh, and the decisions are implemented ahead of time. Uh, and also it's going to be the same decisions that is being implemented in hundreds of thousands of cars. Uh, and now let's suppose now we have two different uh, companies. One of them has a software um, that will, in these situations, will go uh, further from the cyclist and closer to the, uh, to the uh, truck. Uh, after uh, 1 million instances of such instances, maybe those uh, risks will materialize in the death of five passengers. Um, now, let's take a, another company who, who ha whose cars uh, make the decisions to go closer to the cyclist in these situations. Uh, and maybe this, uh, after those 1 million instances, we, the risk will result in uh, fatalities of, of one cyclist. Uh, so in this way, we kind of go back into the same uh, trolley problem, but in the statistical sense, right, uh, where... Uh, these risks that uh, that are being done uh, sometimes they are might be subtle, uh, but they may result in the unequal uh, 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 unequal distribution uh, of risk over the road users. So these are the kind of uh, ethical questions that we're interested in. Um, now, uh, obviously, uh, these kind of decisions are also there is also a patent by Google as well about the calculation of uh, of these kind of decisions as well. So it's not uh, something completely new. Uh, but uh, but we actually thought that uh, we also think that the public should have a say uh, on these decisions as well, uh, because we also we all know about the emotional salience of uh, such uh, uh, crashes that are happening by the automated vehicles uh, and the you know coverage in the media as well. So we built this website which we call Moral Machine, uh, basically a website that generates random um, uh, moral dilemmas that are faced by driverless car and uh, ask you what you think the car should do in those dilemmas. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, dilemma that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so here you would see this is one of the cases, for example, that you would see on the website. Uh, you have a driverless car here, and uh, you have uh, four pedestrian, uh, uh, you know, one man, two women, and a dog uh, who are in uh, crossing in front of the car. And uh, as in every scenario, the brake fail. Uh, now the car is about to kill those four pedestrians. Uh, the only way out is if it swerves on the other side, uh, which means it will uh, hit this uh, barrier and sacrifice its one uh, passenger, which is a female athlete. Uh, now, uh, might be relevant or irrelevant to this uh, scenario that those four pedestrians are all jaywalking, uh, including the dog. Uh, so what would you do? Uh, when the user or you know, whoever visit the website uh, uh, are faced with 13 version of these scenarios, and they would choose uh, the outcome that uh, they approve of uh, uh, more. Uh, and after, at the end of these 13 scenarios, just because they wanted to make this as a, a fun and engaging exercise, uh, we present people with a summary of the results, uh, with, their, with their decisions, uh, in a way kind of like a personality test, uh, but not really. Uh, so, for example, we could tell them, for example, this is the most safe characters or most killed characters. Uh, we tell them as well, uh, when it comes to saving more lives, uh, this is how much it matters to them. Uh, and this is how they compare to other people who have taken uh, the same uh, survey. Uh, and we, uh, in designing this website uh, to make it more uh, engaging and also at the same time to increase the external validity of our finding, uh, we also considered many different types of characters, right? So you have to say, you're going to see here that we have adults, like children, uh, uh, elderly, we have uh, executives uh, and, and athletes and a criminal dog and cat. And each basically uh, scenario is uh, divided into four main components. Uh, you have uh, whether uh, the car is going to continue straight or swerve, uh, which is kind of something related to the omission bias. Uh, it's always, or usually, or in, in many situations, in, uh, it is considered that it's better uh, to let someone die rather than kill someone, um, even though that in both cases, uh, someone will die. Uh, uh, the other, the second component uh, you see here is uh, the relationship of the uh, potential casualties to the driverless car. Uh, in some situations, they could be pedestrians. In other situations, they could be passengers. Uh, there's also a legality of the aspect. Sometimes we have, uh, they are crossing legally or illegally. Sometimes this is not even uh, considered. And, and then there are some characteristics about uh, those uh, pedestrians. In these situations, we have uh, uh, elderly who are crossing the street uh, who are pedestrians, uh, while inside the car, we have younger uh, characters. Uh, so, 
uh, basically, we have actually considered nine different attributes, and we varied those attributes at the top of each other. As I said, one of those attributes was interventionism, stay, over, uh, stay versus swerve. Uh, another one, which I also mentioned, pedestrian passengers. The third one is illegality. And then we also mentioned, for example, we put uh, gender, males versus females, uh, age, uh, fitness level, social status, uh, uh, humans versus pets, and number of characters. So we have these nine different attributes. We vary them on top of each other. We consider many different types of characters. And as a result of that, we end up with uh, millions of possibilities uh, of those uh, scenarios. Um, we also, you know, uh, when we realized that the website uh, started getting a lot of attention, we translated the website into nine other languages. Um, we did like a translation, forward translation, backward translation. It was kind of painful task. Uh, we also had uh, 4 million uh, people visiting the website in the first 18 months. Uh, who contributed to 40 million decisions uh, also in those uh, 18 months. Uh, the numbers now are 7 million users uh, with uh, 80 million decisions. We also had an optional demographic survey at the end uh, where we asked people questions about, uh, about themselves uh, that we had also like about half a million people who answered uh, during that time. Uh, interestingly, people uh, came um, from uh, around the world, from different places in the world here. Just for comparison, you can see here the map of the uh, lit uh, world where, you know, uh, where places where uh, people have electricity or light. Um, and here's what we found. Uh, so to do the results, actually, we did some kind of something called the statistic called conjoint analysis, uh, which was calculate the effect of each factors. In this case, to understand those results, uh, uh, the X axis here is the difference between two probabilities. Uh, the probability, the first one is probability of, of sparing humans. In this case, probability of choosing the right, the right hand side. In this case, sparing humans. Uh, so if we take all the scenarios that have humans and we see how often people spare them in those dilemma, this is the probability. Uh, and then we subtract from that probability of uh, choosing the left hand side. For example, we will take all the cases where we had pets and we see how, how often people spared them. Uh, and then we subtract these two probabilities, we get the X axis. In this case, it's 0.6 is the difference between these two. Uh, we could do something else also on the uh, number of characters. In this case, we can see here that uh, when we add one more uh, life, uh, this would result in increasing the probability of sparing the group uh, by uh, almost uh, 0 0.3 uh, something, right? If we increase it by two or three or four, you can see the numbers. Uh, the average of that uh, is coinciding with the number two. Uh, and then we could do the same for all the other factors, uh, all the nine factors. We can actually also compare those nine factors together. Uh, if you look at the, from the bottom three rows, uh, you would see that sparing humans over pets was the strongest um, uh, effect uh, or the strongest thing that people approved of. Uh, come second is sparing more lives over fewer lives. And then third comes sparing the young over uh, the elderly. And then after that, there are these two things, which are sparing the lawful over the unlawful, and then sparing higher status over lower status. I'm counting from below. Uh, and then the top four rows are, uh, are had the weaker uh, differences. Now, uh, remember that I told you that people came from all around the world. Uh, we had people also almost coming from, uh, from almost every country and territory, uh, but then um, we could actually do the same analysis and calculate the same nine numbers at the level of each country. Now, obviously, uh, some countries, we didn't have uh, so many data. So for this kind of analysis, we, uh, we restricted to the countries from which we had at least 100 uh, participants, uh, which ended up being 130 countries. So basically, what we would do is we calculate those nine numbers for each of those countries. And then uh, we have like a one vector uh, that is nine dimension uh, uh, for each country. And we use that to calculate the difference between the distance between every pair of countries. And then we could use something called hierarchical clustering uh, to basically uh, cluster countries in multiple levels uh, to see which countries are closest to each other in terms of their answers. Uh, this hierarchical clustering can be visualized using this uh, uh, dendrogram. Uh, if we look, uh, having a big, you know, just a general look at this dendrogram, we can see uh, the branches are colored into three different colors. So these are three big clusters. We could say like a, at, at the highest level, these are the three main uh, clusters. We call them uh, Western, Eastern, and Southern. I'll talk uh, uh, more about it now. Uh, we also colored here the names of the countries using uh, something that anthropologists uh, uh, have came up with, it's called Engelhardt. Uh, these are two anthropologists, Engelhardt and Wilsel. Uh, they classified countries into 10 different categories. And uh, some of these, maybe if you're not uh, an anthropologist, some of these may not make sense much uh, to you. Um, 
For example, uh, if we look here at our Western cluster, we would see that there are many countries that are uh, Protestant, uh, or like, you know, have a, a majority of uh, Protestants. Uh, they have many uh, English speaking countries uh, in, in, in purple. And then there are some um, also uh, Orthodox and uh, Catholic uh, countries. Uh, so that's why we call it Western. It has many Western countries. Uh, the second cluster, we call it Eastern because it also had many Eastern countries. Uh, these are Islamic um, countries, South Asian and Confucian uh, countries. And then the third cluster, uh, interestingly, had two subclusters. One of them had uh, Latin American countries. As you can see, they're all in pink here. Uh, the second subcluster had former French uh, colonies. And now uh, we could actually see uh, how each of these different clusters uh, differ from each other in terms of their answers. Um, so just to clarify here that uh, the direction of these preferences uh, are almost universal. So when we talk about sparing the young versus sparing the elderly, uh, it's the same direction uh, we found it in almost every country. So in almost in every country, they spare the young over the elderly. But the magnitude of this difference, difference uh, differed between countries. So for example, if you look at the Eastern cluster, we would see that the difference between uh, the preference to sparing the young over the elderly is less pronounced, which is something that is consistent with other anthropological studies about how the, um, you know, in Eastern culture, they have uh, more respect to their elderly, for example, uh, for, for various different reasons. Uh, we can also see, like, for example, in the Southern cluster, for example, sparing females over males was much more pronounced in the, in the uh, Southern cluster, uh, and which is kind of highly driven by, the, uh, by France, uh, which was quite different from the rest of European countries, for example. Uh, I don't have any explanation for that, uh, to be honest, but it's just kind of something interesting. Uh, we could also uh, try to uh, basically uh, predict uh, what factors could predict those differences. Uh, also in anthropology, there is a factor called uh, individualism, uh, that some societies are individualist uh, society. Uh, they focus on the individuals. Uh, people trust their in institutions. They, uh, their loyalty is for the state. Uh, they have a pro-social, uh, uh, they have a, uh, some kind of, uh, they exhibit pro-social behavior. Uh, while on the other hand, there are some other societies are collectivist. Uh, people don't trust institutions. They seek their extended families for protection. Um, and, uh, and for loyalty, uh, family ties are stronger in these societies. Uh, here we can see that in individualism, uh, they are more egalitarian societies. So uh, sparing more lives is always better than sparing, sparing fewer lives. Uh, we also see correlation between something called uh, rule of law, which is how strongly respected the law in a country and the probability of sparing the lawful uh, uh, in, in a country. So these are the things that I wanted to show. Uh, there were some slides that I had about implications of this. I'm just going to skip those because in the interest of time. Uh, but basically what I was talking about is something called uh, descriptive ethics. Uh, we're talking about what we, what people, what the general public think uh, we should do. But there is something which is not to be confused with normative ethics, which is what we should do. And Germany is, uh, is the first country who thought about this. They uh, assembled a committee of experts, as you can see in all disciplines. And I just... Uh, in this slide, you know, I could, you could ask me about this if you're interested, but basically we draw comparisons with, with the preferences of the public and, the, and, and what these experts have said. And I also talk about the uh, implications of, uh, of, of that having, we have, we have different cultural, you know, cultural differences in terms of these uh, emphasis. I'm not gonna talk about it here. Uh, I just wanted to mention this other follow-up project because this is about modeling. Uh, we did use this data to do a modeling, uh, like computational model of, uh, uh, which basically doing a hierarchical model using Bayesian uh, or probabilistic graphical models. Uh, here we assume that, uh, that participants have latent preferences. And uh, when they answer some of the scenarios uh, on the moral machine, we try to reverse engineer what those latent preferences are. And then we use that to calculate uh, the utility that they have uh, for each, uh, for each uh, scenario or for each outcome. And then we try to predict how they would have answered. Another project, uh, which was people from CMU, uh, it basically, we, from, from some of people's answers or some of the scenarios, we can try to model their answers on the other scenarios, and then we create a collective decision maker, like, a, like an aggregation rule or a voting rule uh, to collect. And these are both are just um, uh, proof of concepts. Uh, we, don't, we don't recommend that this is the way of, of making ethical decisions, obviously, but I just wanted to mention them. Uh, finally, this project was also, because Moral Machine was a success, so we built another project about charity, which was 
basically funded by the Life You Can Save Foundation, uh, which is uh, by Peter Singer, uh, about charity and their interest in, 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 in uh, uh, effective altruism. Uh, in the same way, you could give $100 that will, that will go to Charity A, which will save 20 women uh, in, in North Africa by providing them nutritious meals or or, or help four women in, in North America, for example, providing clean water. And again, we also have different factors. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Edmund, for the very interesting presentation, for sharing with us uh, the design and the main results of this uh, uh, interesting uh, experiment, uh, and which um, yeah goes deep on the relationship between culture and uh, moral decisions. I think that, uh, in my opinion, uh, it represents a, a revolutionary uh, point of view uh, in uh, the science uh, investigating in this topic uh, in traditionally uh, research methods. And although there are uh, obvious differences between uh, this project and the Rayuela project, I think that there are also uh, similarities that we can uh, uh, talk about them uh, in a while. Last but not least, uh, we will cover um, uh, a topic that uh, I'm sure that the previous speaker uh, will agree with me that uh, is um, key when uh, uh, performing uh, human behavior modeling, which is uh, privacy. Um, uh, now we have a, a talk delivered by uh, our colleague uh, Roberto Gonzalez uh, about the relationship between uh, human behavior modeling and privacy, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, the perspective of the PIM City project. Uh, Dr. Roberto Gonzalez received his uh, Master of Science in Telematic Engineering from uh, Polytechnic University of Catalonia and Carlos III University of Madrid, and his PhD in Telematic Engineering from Carlos III University of Madrid in 2001 and 2014, respectively. Indeed, uh, our uh, uh, friendship uh, can comes from these days. Um, he joined the NEC Lab Laboratories Europe in July 2014, where he's now senior researcher. His research interests are online privacy, machine learning, network security, and network measurements with a special focus on the data analytics part. And he has published more than 20 papers in leading venues in web conferences and networking conferences. And as I said, now he's the technical coordinator of the European funded Pain City project. So, Thank you very much, uh, Robert, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Grego. So I, I'm going to present a little bit about the, the PIM City project, but the, the PIM City project is more, it's related with more other things and not only with uh, human behavior. So I will try to focus a little more in the, in the human behavior modeling. And in the PIM City project, uh, we work a lot about privacy online, and privacy online is a lot about online advertisement, uh, right? So. Uh, here, I, I want to put you a, a very simple example. When you are uh, visiting what we call publishers, in this example, for example, ESPN or Oracle Weather, uh, you will see that embedded in the in the website, together with the real content of the put there for, uh, by the publisher, uh, in this case, ESPN something about the sports and Oracle Weather something about the about the weather, uh, we have some advertisers. Right, and in this case, uh, this this uh, is a screenshot I, I did yesterday or Friday. Uh, you see that they are offering me in ESPN. They are offering me an app about a real estate company in Germany and something about holidays. Uh, and in and in Akuweder, they are uh, they are giving me ads about the go to meeting and vendors, something technological. And and you can see that the the topic of the website. It's not related at all to the topic of the ad, right? So in ESPN, I'm not receiving ads about tickets for the next football match or something like that, right? I receive a real estate company and uh, and, uh, and holidays. So this is probably because because some algorithm or someone behind thinks that I like to buy a house or an app or that I want to go to holidays. The last part is completely true. And uh, the same in weather, right? In weather, I'm not receiving I mean, being naive, I'm not receiving uh, advertisement about umbrellas, or I'm not receiving advertisement about uh, holidays, I don't know, about traveling, that when you travel, you like to see uh, the weather, right? It's about technological product that I may use in, in my in my day to day. And uh, this is because someone has a profile of me that basically is done uh, following uh, two steps. 
basically when someone is uh, is browsing online if you go to sports.com the website will ask your uh, your browser to go to uh, something that we call a tracker right to go to a third company that is tracking you on the internet the same when you go to investing.com uh, your browser will go again to tracker to, to that tracker and when you go to music.com uh, they will go to that tracker right so after all this process tracker tracker a in this case already know that user a has visited sport.com investing.com and music.com right and somehow they can use that information to create a profile of the user right a profile of the internet what they think are the interests of the users uh, of course we, in the internet it's not only one tracker we have like a, like a lot of them and even when this seems simple here right like seems like you have a tracker you have some publishers uh, in reality it looks a little more like this so this is like all the companies that are involved in the in collecting data, creating advertisement, and serve them to to the users. And here, a lot of companies uh, are uh, playing uh, playing some different roles. And even when you have all these companies, in reality, most of the revenue goes to a handful of them. Right? Goes to Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, a little more. Right? And why is people doing this profiling? Uh, and, and why all these companies are doing this work? Basically, because it's a, it's a really profitable business, right? So we have the search engines, the ad network, the, even the network providers uh, involved here, uh, because this is this is key for all the online advertisement ecosystem. And the online advertisement ecosystem is uh, is moving a lot of money. So they say uh, only in the US and uh, only uh, ads uh, served to the mobile to mobile devices uh, are going to represent about 120 billion dollars by 2024 right so it's a it's a huge it's a huge market that's why all, all these people is doing this but what happened that this is uh, this kind of data economy is in a is in a really primitive stage so in which uh, you give the data and you get services in exchange right it's like the like 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 how people was doing in, uh, in a lot of a lot of years ago also we have this kind of monopoly or oligopoly uh, with with control that is control uh, all that and what this was is that the the final user that should be the owner of the data does not really have a clear out out opportunity and of course the final user don't have any control on how the data is is trade and how the data is moved right and so far there is not a clear solution for that we have uh, we have seen in the past years uh, an arm race between the privacy protection tools. Uh, that are that are around and the mechanism to circumvent to circumvent those and and more the, lately uh, we have seen that the governments has started to to do laws like the new GDPR or all the laws that are uh, that are doing around the world to kind of define barriers. But even with those laws, uh, we need we need we need technology to support the change because you cannot you cannot do a law to kill a two hundred billion uh, uh, two hundred billion dollar business. And think that with the law nobody will continue to do that, right? And and for us the solutions is what we call personal information management systems, like teams, uh, that basically they are. I mean the concept is a little fuzzy, but basically it's a platform uh, that allow the users to manage their data in a very con in a very controlled way and allow the user most probably to receive something in in exchange of their data, right? That can be money, that can be prices, it can be something like that. But the problem we have here is like even when these pins has started appearing in the past three years, I would say, the business model is still is still not clear, right? So a lot of uh, startups are appearing, they stay for a couple of years, they get some some thousands or, or even millions of users, and then they don't, they are not able to monetize the business and they and they disappear. So we think that to make this faster. Uh, we need a lot, a lot of trial and error cycles, and to can do that efficiently, we don't want every PIMS to build a technological solution from scratch. So in PIM City, what we are doing is we are designing kind of Lego blocks, right? Uh, that all these uh, technological Lego blocks that all these uh, PIMS can directly plug into their business, and they don't have to develop everything from scratch, right? Because they they already have this this information, and we want to develop this. Uh, these blocks and then we want to demonstrate that they that they work uh, here we have a small uh, summary of the blocks we are we are building for the sake of time i'm not going into details but basically we have three categories of blocks uh, some blocks that are designed to to improve the data subject privacy like for example a personal data safe that is a 
kind of a database that is encrypted by default that you can go and install directly so that you don't have to care about all these uh, security and encryption and encryption issues. Uh, some tools to allow this new data economy, basically with a trading engine that allow the interchange of data uh, for, for money, and some other tools to, to, to manage the data, right? to, ha to handle the data easily. Uh, and among them, we have the data knowledge extraction that is uh, where we are uh, doing our human behavior modeling. We are doing uh, what we call our profiling. Uh, then uh, we will try to integrate all these components into, a, into our own platform that we aim to test with uh, several thousand of users. And in the final platform, we will have the personal data avatar that is basically a summary of all the information of, all the, of a user and the and information this user wants to share with other people. And here we include uh, an automatic interest profiling that we are uh, that we are doing with the uh, with the permission of the users of K, of course. The transparency tags less related to to this workshop, but the idea here is to have something similar to the nutrition labels you have in the food that are telling you the number of calories that this uh, this specific product has. Something but something similar, but for the privacy in the in the internet, and of course. Uh, a dashboard to allow the users to to manage all this, and a marketplace to allow data buyers to trade uh, and to buy and to buy data. And if I go now, how we want to do the user profiling? Our idea is simple, as they are doing in the in the online advertisement. Uh, what we do is to have is uh, when we have a user that we know and we know the user has visited some website, and we can know how the user visited some website in very different ways. Uh, for example, if a network uh, operator is involved, the network operator can directly look into the network and see the website they are visiting. We want to apply some kind of some kind of profiling and obtain the profile of the user that then can be used specifically for this user for online advertisement or to generate reports. But what is the first problem we have here? And the first problem is we need to assign categories to the website, right? Here we know that the first one is about education, the second one is about music. Uh, but uh, but you but you need to know that in a way, uh, and this is this is not easy. Uh, you can do it in two ways. You can do it manually, so you can assign a, a guy to to categorize to tag all the websites. But this is so this is so expensive, right? This is impossible because you can do it for thousands of websites, but you have millions of different uh, websites online, and or you can do it automatically. For example, if you have the content, you you can. You can have the text of uh, of ESPN apply so natural language processing and assign an automatic tag. But this is this is also not easy. And I, I'm not going to details, but uh, we were doing some experiments, and for 80% of the websites, it's this impossible to do this. Uh, so we need a category, we need a way to can do the profiling of the users, even if we don't know the categories of a lot of websites, right? And for that, what we use is uh, we use uh, we use a ski brand that is a technique coming from the natural language processing uh, uh, world in which what you try to do is, is to find relation among, uh, among elements in a sequence, right? So intuitively what we do is for all the website that has been ever visited by, by different users, uh, we create a representation space. Here uh, you have a 2D uh, represent representation space, right? But in reality, we will have something like 100 dimensions Right, where in this space we place, we try to place together to each other uh, domains that are related among them. Right, so that way our our hope is that even if we don't know what is api.booking.com, if uh, it's in if in our space it's placed close to kayak.com and to advisor.com, we can think that probably api.booking.com is our traveler. Right, and then when we have this representation, when we have this representation space. Uh, to create a profile is very easy. You only you only need the browsing a temporal window on the browsing history of the user. Uh, in this case, a user that has visited GitHub, uh, Wikipedia, Stack Overflow, Twitch, and Adidas, and pass it to our through through our uh, is is a deep learning uh, is a is a deep learning network, right? Project the user into our representation space and create the and create the profile. So, uh, as you can see. Uh, to create a profile for a user is very easy, but what is the problem? That to create a good profile is uh, is not that easy, right? So everybody can create a profile. The thing is how good is the profile, and measuring how good is a profile, in my opinion, is something something that is very difficult. 
Uh, one option is you can ask the final user, right? You can ask the user, I have this profile for you. Do you think this is accurate? But what is the problem? That the profile we are generated is assigning values between zero and one for 340 different categories, right? Ranging from interest in sports, uh, football, uh, uh, La Liga, to, I don't know, to, re to religious uh, Catholic, right? So we have, we have all that many categories. So it's, it's in practice impossible for a user to can really assess if the profile is good for, uh, is good for her or not. Uh, and also because we cannot compare with other profiling algorithms similar to us, because the typical profiling algorithm for, for online advertising uh, are, are unknown. They are proprietary from, from companies and they, and they don't serve them. So what we did is we, we prepared an experiment to assess the quality of our profiles. And we realized that most of the online advertisement campaigns are evaluated basis in the, in the click-through rate. This is how many ads are clicked by the user for every 100 ads, right? Like the percentage of ads that are clicked. Uh, so we decided to use the click-through rate as a proxy, to, as a proxy of, for the quality of our, of our profile with the hypothesis that if you serve ads that are related to the profile of the user, the user will be uh, more prone to click onto, onto those ads. Uh, but the problem is how you measure the click, the click through rate, right? Only Google and these companies can, uh, can do that. So for that, we created a Chrome extension and we gave it to, to more than 1,000 users. And, in, and with our extension, of course, with the permission of the users, we are able to collect the website visited by the users so that we can make a profile of the users. Uh, we, can, we can know the different the ads that has been served to the users. Even we can, we can get the, the commercial, that is the image of the, of the ad, the landing page that is the website that the user will visit if the if they if they click, and also we can know if the users are clicking or not into the uh, into the ads. And of course, our uh, to can serve our own ads, our extension is also able to replace uh, ads for the users. So here we have an example. Before in Yahoo, the user was uh, was receiving an ad about cars, another one about uh, Dua Lipa, I think, uh, but. In our, after our profiling, we chain those ads for another ones. So the, the user is only watching our ads instead of the, the, of the original one. And we only now, we, we have the extension, we only have to measure the, the click-through rate. So we use uh, five months uh, to collect data and fine-tune the system. During that five months, uh, we collected uh, 12,000 different commercial, different ads that we had to check all of them manually because uh, Basically, because we had, for example, porn ads that we didn't want to, to show to the users. So we had to do a manual filter on, on the ads uh, we received. Uh, and we use that to fine tune and to train our, uh, our, our engine, our representation space, as I was saying before. And then during, uh, during one month, we started doing profiling for all our users, right? And we started changing all the ads they were, uh, they were receiving, right? And after this period, we observed more than 75 million uh, connections to 470,000 different, different home names. And uh, we observed the, the user were served with 270,000 ads uh, that, and we replaced, we replaced about 70,000 70, of them. And uh, we, replaced it, we replaced it with ads created with our uh, profile and also with ads selected at random from our own, uh, from our own database, right? So for, for every user we have, for the normal ad, we have the, ad, the number of ads they receive it, and the number of ads they click. And we have the same for the random ads, we replace it, and for the really user profiling ads, uh, we receive it. And uh, what do you think? Do you think we could improve uh, the result of the line advertisement? So here, here we have the results, and uh, the, the click-through rate, so the percentage of ads clicked by the, by the users. When we, selected the, when we selected the baseline at random, it was uh, 0.124. So this is about one ad clicked every 800 ads. Actually, it, it seems low, but it's, it's not that bad. So it's in the line of what is uh, expected in uh, in online advertisement campaign. The baseline, so the all, the really online advertisement with all these people doing profile obtaining data, got uh, 0 0.168. This is 35% better than random. So it's better than random, but it's not that better, right? Uh, and in uh, with our profiling system. Uh, we obtain a click-through rate of 0 0.217, 
which is about 30% better than the, than the standard, than the standard advertisement. And we have to take into account that in our experiment, we were using only a window of 20 minutes uh, information per user because it's not so privacy preserving, but at least it's more private than having a, a profile for the last uh, two years of the, of the user. We don't use any, demogra any demographics like gender, age, location. So it's possible that we are serving ads in German to people in, uh, in Spain, right? Uh, and we didn't use any dynamic like videos or something like that. Our ads were like uh, a static, a static ad. So we expect that, our, that we can improve our result. So I, I want to conclude now with, uh, with three uh, messages. In my opinion, that the most difficult part of doing a profile is not doing a profile itself. It's doing a good profile, but it's how to measure that your profile is, is accurate, right? How to measure that what you are doing is, uh, is good. Uh, also that with a simple profiling method uh, that we use it and we kind of limited information, it is possible to improve the, the click-through rate of the typical online advertisement. So probably all these guys are not doing such a, a, a great job. And finally, I want to leave a, an open question. And is it, is it is worth the cost, both in privacy for the users and in uh, engineering with all these companies trading in data, uh, collecting data, to get an improvement of only 35% of a random search, right? So, so probably if you go to contextual ads, something like that, you, you could get even better, you will go even better, better than random. So I want to, to leave this question there, if, if you consider that it's worth or not this, uh, this cost. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any doubt, I, I don't know if we have a lot of time for that now, but <laughs> I leave the floor to Gregor again. Thank you very much, Robert, for the very interesting presentation. Indeed, we are right now in a online adver advertisement campaign in the Master of Cyber Security here in Comillas, and I will suggest that they uh, call you uh, so that we can use your uh, <laughs> your browser extension. Uh, jokes, uh, joking aside, uh, I think that uh, online advertisement is uh, uh, all about uh, profiling. Um, profiling is a kind of a human behavior modeling and uh, as long as uh, for human behavior modeling uh, in most of the cases we rely on uh, involving people in the experiments I think that privacy is, is a key issue there and indeed um, uh, in the almost one year this first one year of the project we have heard uh, many of the uh, blocks that you show in the uh, architecture of a uh, city project, such as personal consents, uh, privacy preserved uh, analytics. So I think that um, some of the ideas you are developing in this project may, uh, may be relevant and may be applied in, in other contexts. So uh, thank you so much for uh, the uh, nice presentation. We still have a uh, like uh, 10 minutes for a uh, discussion and question and, and answers. Uh, I think that uh, we have a, a question from uh, Mario Castro, from uh, my colleague Mario Castro, who is also involved in the Rayuela project indeed. Uh, may I uh, read it, Mario? Yeah, sure. Or go ahead if, if you... Uh... So I have a very bad connection, but I'll try. So my question is, for Ansha and Edmond, if you are aware of some approaches to your data based on medium-based modeling, so because now, now I understand that you are trying to collect data using real experiments, but I'm curious if you are able to predict or to model, for instance, outlier behavior or free riders behavior using medium-based models, and if those models capture more or less this, this sort of experiment. Well, uh... In my case, thanks for your question. In my case, we've done a few papers already simulating the experiments with agent-based models. So to some extent, the answer to your question is yes. We've done models that are kind of specific for each experiment, but there are some principles like, for instance, the use of uh, models based on reinforcement learning that typically lead to very, very good results in, in uh, reproducing the experimental results. Now, details may depend on the specific experiment, but yes, indeed, this is possible. And at least ourselves, we've done it a few times. Uh, in, in my case, I don't, I don't know if you did consider that an agent-based simulation, but it's not really more like, it's not really a simulation, but more like modeling 
the the one of the project that I mentioned, uh, which was very quickly, so maybe I didn't really present it very well, um, that when we try to model people's answer like their latent preferences, we actually have an assumption that uh, groups of people who are in the same country would have some share some uh, kind of characteristics. So it was kind of hierarchical in that sense that uh, these agents shared this one uh, one thing, but at the same time there was no interaction. Uh, assumed there uh, between those different agents, uh, if, if that's kind of the, it was more like a, each person is assume, assumed that as an independent, but also with the, with the fact that they're all like some groups are belong to one country, and their their behavior will be closer to each other than to, close to other countries. Okay, thanks. Eddie, you have a question? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One it is for Ansha and the other it is for, for Edmond. And also, Mary, I do not forget about the conversation that, or the discussion that we can have uh, about the, the theories, whether the theories that apply for criminology can also apply for cyber, cyber criminology. Um, Ansha, I was just wondering whether, well, two, two things. First, when you were showing us these two graphs differentiating between um, the infor when you have the information and then all of them try to more or less adapt to the average that is being uh, given and when you do not have that information. I was just wondering two things. First, it is what would it happen if you would um, lie to the guys? Uh, say, for example, that you um, say that the average was um, much lower than it would really be. Will they uh, adapt also to that average? Or for example, will they deem that that average is too low and maybe it will be better to give a little bit more? Um, I would really like to know uh, what will happen. Even also, I was um, thinking about having two groups in one you are lying to them, in the other you are not, so that you can compare like the control group and the line group. Uh, what do you think that would happen if you will have lied to them? Uh, they would, I mean, if they are not aware that you're lying, they would probably follow what you're telling them. Now, the problem is that uh, our uh, subject pool is typically used for economics experiments. And as you probably know, economists don't tolerate lying to subjects. And mm -hmm. once you lied in one experiment, your, sub your subject pool is doomed forever. <laughs> so we haven't tried uh, doing this. Even when you're lying for science. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's kind of within the project, there were uh, economists and psychologists, and there were continuous fights about this. <laughs> so, having said that, we are working now on, on a theory of behavior with uh, with uh, Sergei Gabrilich in the States. And uh, there, we think that if you tell them, not lying, but, but as an external authority, that you should do this or you should do that. Mm -hmm. It's very funny because our theory predicts that more often than not, that would backfire. Mm -hmm. We have run experiments on that, but we don't have the results yet. Because uh, retaking the idea of lying, I was thinking that maybe it could have some um, interesting idea underlying, which is uh, whether it is social pressure, what makes people decide the future um, endowment, or whether it is as some kind of moral um, idea that, that they have. And I was comparing this to the Joe Henrich and, and colleagues um, ultimatum game all around the world, yeah. in which you will find uh, some average, some common average, which will differ um, depending on the on the country. So first I was asking myself, well, maybe the, the graph that Ansha has shown us has this average because it was conducted here in, in Spain. But what will it happen if you had conducted absolutely the same experiment, but for example, in China, Japan, or whatever tribe in, in Africa, that, that average will surely have uh, been, been different, right? Um, then if you have the average of some given country, some given culture, let's say, and you lie uh, about that average, then you will find whether subjects are really uh, struggling with their um, cultural average idea or the social pressure and I think that that kind of experiments will be like by Edmond also uh, because of the yeah. cultural things that he was he was saying um, then the second question and um, the last question that I have it was for Edmond um, I would like to uh, because I, I think that I skipped some information I would like for um, 
to ask you please uh, to dig a little bit more about the West, East and South uh, a kind of uh, moral conduct. Because I was performing an experiment together with a colleague in Colombia about, um, well, there, there were a lot of adolescents and they will be playing a video game. And during the video game, they will think that they were being monitored, even though they were not. And the guys in Spain acted very differently from the guys uh, in Colombia, uh, just taking into consideration that um, uh, variable being uh, monitored. And I think that being monitored is something related to morality in the sense that there are some eyes that are looking at you, right? Uh, what we found in the Colombian sample, it was something that we could not um, label as West or East. So I was wondering whether it was South, and we did not know about that South before. So maybe I, I will appreciate if you can dig a, bit, a little bit uh, about that. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, the South is, is kind of like, it's not, I wouldn't say it's something that anthropologists have uh, let's say specifically uh, talked about uh, necessarily saying like there was before like the East and West divide, uh, but it was also very much criticized about, you know, that it's kind of very reductionist uh, putting things into East and West. And one of the reasons is actually because of the Latin American countries, because they are not, there are some things where they align with the West, other things they align with the East, right? And that's why people talk more about different measures like the individualism, for example, versus talking about the but relational mobility. Yeah, or, yeah, or, or or also talking about relational mobility as a factor, or tightness, looseness. Um, so I would say, you know, I guess the the clusters that we came up with were completely bottom up. They were completely driven by data. Uh, but then, you know, we tried to kind of like post hoc think about uh, how, you know, why why we why we had these uh, three different groups. It's it is really true that the Latin American countries do sometimes side with the East, sometimes with the West for many different reasons, right? And when we say the West, we also mean that also uh, Australia as well, mm -hmm. Commonwealth, Commonwealth and North America, Western, Western Europe as well. Uh, Eastern Europe is also not clear. Sometimes it goes with the, with the East, sometimes it's with the West. So there are kind of, these are not really, uh, I would say, uh, very kind of clear divide. Uh, so I would say- yeah, like these yeah, categories it's, that they can flow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you, I would say, I mean, I don't know if, uh, if that's relevant, like, but I think uh, when we're trying to find, like, in, in line with John Henrik's uh, call for, like, going beyond the weird psychology, weird, weird psychology uh, is to, you know, to try to sample from uh, very different countries, right? Mm -hmm. And if, you, if, you're, if you're gonna, if you're limited by, let's say, four or five countries, I would say, you know, uh, yes, you could choose the Western countries and the Eastern countries, but maybe also choose the Latin American countries. So it's good that you know you already have that in uh, in your experiment, but it's going to be really hard to say uh, why why it is different unless we have multiple multiple yeah. countries. Right? Could you please share with me or with us uh, the bibliographical reference of that paper so that I can have a look to it, please? Yeah, sure. I have a there is also a free access link as well. Thank you. Great, so those were my two questions, Grego, um, um, also if Mary would like to add something about the, how we need to adapt the theories, traditional theories to uh, current cyber psychology, I would be really delighted to, to hear her thoughts. Sure. I mean, if you look at uh, classic uh, profiling methodology, which would be Alison and Cabell 2006, you have a basic, um, you have two assumptions. You have the consistency assumption, and it dictates that the behavior of a threat actor will remain reasonably consistent. So that's the consistency assumption. But the problem is, as technology evolves, the behavior is also evolving. So that presents a major challenge to the consistency assumption that has to be factored in. And the second is the homology assumption. And it dictates that offense style will reflect threat actor characteristics. Um, but when you look at anonymity, and you mentioned this in your talk in cyber context, will the characteristics remain uniform? And will they change from real world to the virtual world, from crime to crime, and from platform to platform? So I think that the, the, what we need to do is look at these standard theoretical constructs and then and, and 
hypotheses and then question them through the lens of human behavior mediated by technology, because that's where we're going to get the scientific uh, breakthroughs. I mean, you mentioned geographic profiling, Rosmo's work, and then you have David Cantor's work as well, which I'd recommend that you look at in the area of geographic profiling. But if you're going to consider geographic profiling, then you have to start conceptualizing cyberspace as a domain, as an environment, a surface web, deep web, start thinking about those in a geographical context. It's and a then, new continent indeed, yeah. Well, it's, it's an environment. So in 2016, NATO ratified cyberspace as an environment. So this is a powerful psychological environment. But we can think about it as a psychological space, but we can also think about it as an environmental space. Have a look at the work of Prochensky from the 1980s, environmental psychology, a certain kid growing up in a certain home in a certain neighborhood, and the impact of that environment on the behavior. Now transpose that to cyberspace and start thinking about young people growing up online, surface and deep web. Start thinking about dark nets. Check out my paper, The Cyber Blue Line, just published uh, by uh, for Europol, I'll drop it into the feed, which actually examines the social contract between policing and civil society in an age of technology and factors in this concept of the environment of cyberspace. So, and, and the impact of that environment on behavior, and then where are these fault lines and who is responsible? So I think that there are these you know, paradigm shifts necessary in terms of how we think about human behavior mediated by technology. I, I'll send you a couple of papers when I did for the European Investment Bank, which was on cyberspace. So conceptualizing cyberspace as an environment, drawing on the learnings in environmental psychology, looking at theoretical constructs that are relevant to environment and also relevant to human behavior, uh, like routine activity theory. What does that look like transposed to cyberspace? And also, I, I would say, so, sorry if, if anyone has another question, but I would not like to miss um, this opportunity. Um, I was also thinking that the human behind the machine that you were saying, it, it is uh, absolutely interesting and necessary and mandatory to be analyzed also, because when we were interviewing some of the mm -hmm. online grooming offenders, uh, we, will find in, uh, we were finding that within the same offender, there were different motivations, uh, even by to do or to perform the same crime so that you will find some intention or some other and this will lead to some modus operandi or to some other so for example if this online grooming offender i uh, would just like to uh you know have a, a sexual contact with someone uh he will vary in the modus operandi um if he in another uh with another subject will just like to get some images that not meeting in the real life. So the intention also is um, like addressing the kind of models of Randy that they are using. Yeah, and certainly, and that evolves as well. So if we think about classic child related sex offending, the motivational driver to actually access the images was the sexually deviant interest in the child. But what we see now is a whole new evolution and our work at Europol has found the an evolution where you now have a large cohort who are trading in these images, not because they have a sexual deviant interest in the child, but their motive is that they have a commercial interest. So it's the monetization of the content. So now you've got two powerful drivers, one is deviance, one is commercial, engaging in the same behavior. And that's what I was pointing to about, you know, a challenge to the consistency assumption that as the technology changes, the behavior is evolving and the motives are differing. Nice, very interesting. Thank you uh, so much uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, since we have just uh, run out of time, uh, I would suggest uh, finishing here. Uh, I would stay uh, uh, in the workshop for uh, a long while uh, more, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's time to leave. So. Uh, Thank you everybody for uh, this inspiring workshop and uh, and thank you for uh, attending uh, the workshop also to the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.